John, thank that was an extremely cogent. Uh, <laughs> one of the best runs through I have ever heard, actually, of that particular. That was excellent. Um, a couple of thoughts. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a product of the, you know, the, we had the folk music scare and then the science journalism boom, and I'm a product of the folk, of the science journalism boom. Uh, I came of age at, uh, during Science 80 and all of that stuff. You know, one of the ironies that I think you touched on indirectly is that there probably is a bigger audience for science information today than there has ever been, and there probably is less revenue available to those who produce it. And uh, it, it, it's this interesting, you know, disjuncture caused by this technological revolution. So, John, let me start with you with our little whip around and game show. Everybody will win one point for their answer, uh, which is so given what you just talked about, is society at large uh, spending enough on science communication? Are we investing in this area from your perspective at the right degree? And you can take that question as you will. Well, if you're at a session like that, you better say no. <laughs> um, I'm actually, you know, when you say is society investing enough in communication, um, I, I think that it, it's a little bit less about money and more about structure. In other words, in, term, in, in investing. I'm not sure we're investing enough time, effort, which is indirectly money. But I don't think a huge slug of money is necessarily what's needed. I think what is more needed are mechanisms how we can better utilize the skill, the opportunities, coordinate them that are out there. And that was alluded to, I guess, from the first day of the meeting. Uh, I wouldn't, if somebody said, uh, give me a million dollars to do X or Y, I would be hard put to do that as at the moment in terms of science communication. That's probably to some extent my own ignorance, but I think that I would always answer no because I don't think we spend enough money on science education, which is a core part of communication, and I'm not sure we spend enough money on communication, but I'm still not convinced where or I need to know better how we would spend those dollars and how we could, in fact, uh, feed into the, the uh, structures that we have and better coordinate and better utilize them. All right, so let's come down the table towards me. And uh, Al, you want to take a swing at that? Well, I, I'd work on a congressional committee, so my answer uh, is in the context of uh, of an inquiry that we're conducting right now with the National Institutes of Health about what they're spending under the term uh, communication activities. Um, and in particular, that inquiry was spurred by things that were going on at the National Cancer Institute. So um, I, I don't think that's really the right question. <laughs> it's really my answer because in, in, ter in terms of what's going on at NIH, because they don't have the money. It's not about, you know, ideally if money wasn't an issue, should we be spending more? The fact of the matter is they can't spend uh, because, uh, you know, their budget was doubled. Uh, their budget doubled between 1998 through 2003. And since that time, uh, it's been flat. Uh, I mean, in terms of the number, it hasn't really changed except for a brief uh, moment uh, with some stimulus money in 09 and 10, but just a little bit. And so what has been going on is, uh, uh, and I'll use uh, the National Cancer Institute as, a, as an example, is they've been under the, again, it's all a matter of defining your terms too. Uh, uh, because, uh, you know, Rick raised the question in his uh, presentation this morning about the troubling issue, I guess, that was identified in your, your, your first day of this program, which is what's communication about uh, or distinguishing between communication of science to the public versus communication about uh, the agency itself trying to promote itself and, and build its image. You know, is that really communicating information about science? Uh, so uh, you're going to have to get through 
well, what kind of communications are we talking about? And, but the real pertinent question right now is, which NCI is answering, because they were spending about $68 million a year in 2000, fiscal year 2006 for the Office of Communication and Education, um, and whatever that covers. And then now uh, that is uh, down is somewhere in the 34 million. So that started under one administration uh, into another one. So this is not a political decision as much as it's driven by uh, the Financial Times and the budgetary constraints. And, you know, the other issue is uh, raised in the editorial and the journal Nature uh, about the situation at the National Cancer Institute is maybe you need to create better efficiencies in your communication activities and, uh, you know, you, you cut a couple of million dollars, that's, that money can be reprogrammed to fund research grants, which is what Dr. Collins uh, the leader of the NIH is so concerned about, especially in a time of sequestration. So, the real the 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 question is, they don't they get, they're going to have to cut back and rethink their whole approach to what they're spending on communications. But then that gets you into what it, into a, a deeper discussion as to your definition of terms. So, I'm priorities, sorry, I'm not really priorities, answering your question. A common but. issue in Washington: priorities. <laughs> uh, next. Take. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, oh yeah, thank you. First of all, I have to, to for full disclosure, I'm uh, the senior vice president of the Pacific Science Center in Seattle, Washington, a public science museum, and I'm where. So I have these really two hats. I'm I'm a rotator at the National Science Foundation, and as this conversation goes on, I really have to wear both those hats because uh, my career is in science communication, whether it's through museums, uh, uh, connections to the formal STEM education world, or um, uh, doling out the money, so to speak, at the National Science Foundation. Uh, so in answering this question, it's a, it is an interesting one in terms of putting it in, in the area of money. Um, I, I think if you asked, it's, uh, going, since we started with sports over here, you know, one of my fantasies, I, I think of it as a dream, but it really is a fantasy, is that someday science would be as pervasive as sports. So you have you know, after school sports, intramural sports, and, and I know we've made it when everybody has to rush home for Monday night science. Uh, which is a real fantasy, but but the question is. So then you would ask. So do sports people think we've spent too much? If we need more science communication in sports, I'll bet you most of the people that are really involved with it say yes, and many of us would say wow. So I don't think it is a question of do we need more. Yes, we do, but then the question is where should that be allocated? And and I do think there are areas that are absolutely critical, and it's sort of been alluded to here. And one is, and the group's going to deal with that, and this is an issue for a project that I've been the principal investigator of for many years called Portal to the Public, and that's uh, which brings scientists into museums to uh, interact face-to-face -face with public audiences, with you know, kids, adults, whoever's there. Uh, and that is the core competencies. What are the core competencies that are needed? If, if you're talking about scientist interaction now, uh, interactions with science media and all the things, but if you're talking about scientists really communicating, uh, and they might do it through video or on the floor of a museum, however they do it, what are the core competencies to be effective communicators? I think that's a big area where there ought to be more money and, and it could be quite dramatic. I think the other thing is the infrastructure. It, you have to figure out the way in which to build infrastructures, whether it's through professional organizations, which are well represented here, through things like Portal of the Public, which is now in 43 museums around the country, so it's an infrastructure. Um, what's the infrastructure that's needed for the infrastructure? How do you bring people together as a professional learning community? I think all of those things, because that's the way sustainability will ultimately occur. So I think the infrastructure and the core competencies and how you get uh, scientists to have core competencies, where that money should go, because I think that will multiply, because uh, ultimately it's going to be, uh, I'll go back to the society since they're here, and I think about it, it's going to be in their best interest to put some core money into it because it allows them to get information out that's going to build their profession. I'll leave it there. Well, I'll echo everyone here in saying that um, the answer to are we spending enough really comes down to um, who are you communicating to and why? And so it, it always depends. It's all context dependent. Uh, dependent, and I feel like I have to say that because I'm an ecologist and that's our answer to everything. Um, 
And for uh, my foundation, as with many foundations, we are issue focused. We care about certain issues. For my foundation, it's conservation and the environment. And um, so I will add one other component to this question of are we spending enough, which is there's the, the problem of supply. Do we have scientists who are trained in communication, willing to speak about their work and connected to uh, the right audiences? But there's also the demand side. Are we creating a demand for good science, both uh, in advocacy groups and NGOs who might be advocating for uh, solutions to societal problems and with our policy and decision makers. And so are we holding NGOs and government agencies and policy makers accountable for using the best available science? Are we creating that demand? So it's both a question of who's talking and who is listening. And I think we need to be thinking about both of those issues. Well, um I will try to answer that question, but I have to admit I cannot answer that question about enough because, well, if you want to know what, whether funding is enough, you have to first know what the current state is. And so I don't. So my disclaimer is I have no data. Sorry for that. Um, <laughs> and um, the reason and is And just to because, I clarify, you're talking about data on, on federal investment, yeah, I federal, assume. Right. So my part of the, the question is the federal investment. What is the federal government investing in science communication? I don't know that answer, so I can't tell whether that's enough or not. And why? It's because science communication is not a separately budgeted activity in the federal government. So I am part of a rather elaborate infrastructure in the executive branch to collect data on funding for research and development, for STEM education, for physical research infrastructure such as laboratories, big pieces of equipment, and cyber infrastructure. Um, and also human resources, the people involved in the enterprise. So we have lots of data on that. So we can break it out into, you know, life sciences, you know, what part of that. But we don't have um, data on science communication as a separate activity. Um, and we do know that, it, that the federal government does support science communication, but it's part of other activities, uh, such as, of course, the research enterprise, as part of research, um, as part of federal science agencies, legislative and public affairs uh, offices. And so we can try to you know, count that as a proxy. We know that there are many programs, such as uh, the, the ones we've heard about at NSF, that support science communication. Um, but you know, there's not the, the infrastructure to bring those together into a, a good data set. Now, is that good? Well, that's, that's a question for all of us. You know, should there be a, a more of an infrastructure? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that, but of course, maybe collectively we, we can help to, we can try to understand that. You know, one uh, interesting thing for me, uh, looking at the, the federally supported science enterprise, is that even when it comes to formal science communication, the federal government has not taken a leadership role in that. And I'm talking, of course, about uh, the peer-reviewed journal uh, infrastructure, such as science, my former employer. Um, the federal government supports a lot of the research uh, that is conducted, but when it comes to publishing that research, and communicating that research in the science community, we know that m most of that is in private hands. It is in the journals, which are you know, science, as you know, as I know, is not part of the federal government. That journal is, is a private nonprofit enterprise. Um, so it is supported by federally support funded research, but that infrastructure is outside the federal government. And of course, we know when we expand that beyond formal science communication to uh, this broader life sciences communication that we're talking about, that most of that activity is outside the federal government. And I suspect that it is supported by, uh, by, by uh, funding sources that are outside the federal government. So and, that's a long way and to Kay, go. And yes. let me just ask you to put this in context. Can you remind folks of what the R&D landscape in the United States looks like? What, what is, what's the total spending on R&D, private and public in the U.S? Okay. 140? $450 billion. Right. The, the U.S. 
Uh, U.S. F supports $450 billion worth of research and development. There is an official government definition of research and development. And what proportion of that, is, of that is, t is public? Of that, uh, two-thirds two of that is privately funded. That is mostly companies, but also uh, nonprofits and foundations. And then one-third of that is the federal government, about $140, $150 billion. Right, and so then we can quibble, but the general conception is that the taxpayer is more down at the basic research end of the scale, yes. and then you move towards the more applied end of the research scale as you move towards private. And, and all along that spectrum, everybody is communicating in some form what they do, whether it's yes. a press release touting some drug that actually right. doesn't work, or whether it's right. a federal agency touting its greatest in latest advance in supercomputing, right? Right. right. And the, the public in, communication is important to federal agencies because ultimately, why are they supporting research? It's because it contributes somehow to their mission. Um, so if you're looking at, at life sciences, for example, National Institutes of Health, then kind of this ideal model is that why do NIH-funded researchers do communication? It's to disseminate the results of research in ways that can change people's health behavior can change, you know, companies' activities that are involved in the health space, and of course, ultimately, to make people healthier. Uh, that's the model of it. Right, or as we reporters often remind them, you want to talk to me about your research because if you want Congress to support it, they need to know what you're doing. What is that, too? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe which which actually, Alan, I'd call. like to come back yeah. to you because a number of the folks, panelists here, spoke, addressed directly or indirectly this issue of effectiveness. Is, so we talked about quantity, which is one issue, but then there's the quality issue, which is, mm -hmm. is, is this having an impact? And we've already heard from Rick and Bruce that, boy, evaluating this is really hard and it depends on what you're evaluating for. But your committee has actually tried to do this, right? You guys have tried to look at a particular chunk of spending at a particular agency and ask, is it achieving something that is in the public interest? And can you talk a little bit about how you addressed that issue and why it even came up? Uh, I did. I forgot Kai on the phone. Hold on, Alan. <laughs> sure. I'd actually made a note of myself to remind Kai, you want to wade in here? Thank you very much, David. Uh, I, first, I think that, that the high level of this uh, conversation this morning uh, is really quite inspiring to me. Um, the Packard Foundation. Uh, just in terms of what uh, Kay was just saying, uh, accounts for about 0.5 percent of the uh, <clears throat> 0.05 percent of the overall uh, R&D spending in the United States. Um, a, little, a little bit less than that, uh, and that I think puts into perspective the role of private philanthropy. Uh, we're the eighth largest private foundation uh, in the country, and we account for uh, something that, you know, is a rounding error is even uh, too, too much to say about, about what we're doing. Over the past <clears throat> decade or so, we've been supporting uh, Compass, uh, Brooke Smith's organization, uh, and, and, uh, and trying to, to not only to demonstrate uh, what they're doing um, and to demonstrate a model of science communication, which I want to say a bit more about <clears throat> in a moment, uh, this is science communication that is allied somewhat uneasily with activism. Um, and, and also to begin to build uh, an infrastructure that works uh, in our particular context of funding largely uh, NGOs uh, in, the, in, the, in the conservation space. Um, Today, Compass raises about half of their budget from sources beyond the Packard Foundation, although we remain, we remain their largest uh, funder. Mm -hmm. And over that, that last uh, 15 years or so, Compass has pioneered a nationally significant model. So it's so not a question of scaling up uh, in the sense of, of gaining broader reach. Uh, I think Compass has an impressive reach and, and has developed really a way of communicating conservation science um, that is uh, uh, that has really changed things uh, in in measurable ways. Uh, let me say that with some uh, trepidation in front of David Malakoff because uh, the science journalists are, of course, uh, in many ways the the, um, uh, the judges of whether we've been successful. Now, what we've been doing, I think, that what the what the Packard Foundation has been doing is not just Compass, uh, but we've been investing in total somewhere between a million and a million and a half dollars a year. So we are the we're 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 one example of what John Burris would do, uh, 
might might do if he had an extra million dollars a year. Uh, and and uh, as Amanda said, we've been uh, trying to increase the supply of scientists who are interested in communicating. That is building on the intrinsic and trying to, to strengthen the intrinsic um, motivation. We've funded uh, a program called the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program, uh, which is housed at Stanford but reaches all across North America uh, to environmental and conservation scientists. We've now um, uh, enlisted and trained about 200 fellows over the course of the last 12 years. Uh, <clears throat> Compass, you, you know about already, but Compass's job is really to be help build the demand for science uh, communications, uh, to build an audience, uh, to demonstrate the, the viability of the model, uh, and also to, to engage in training. Some of the Compass has historically contributed um, important parts of the communications training of the Otto Leopold program. And <clears throat> The foundation has also been uh, a quiet partner of the Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, in California, uh, which is which was founded by the Packard family uh, and is a major uh, science uh, science engagement institution on its own. Uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium is self-sustaining in the sense that the, that the gate uh, pays for their operating expenses, the, not the capital expenses. Um, and and I think in all of these enterprises, we have been drawing upon scientists from across academic institutions, and that's uh, an infrastructure model that's different from uh, this uh, office of, of communication within universities that uh, that John mentioned. Um, we've done that partly through uh, the the prominence of conservation and environment uh, in the culture, um, and so we I, I think what, what I would describe this as as trying to promote. Uh, science that informs people uh, in controversial areas. Uh, this is an, always an uneasy alliance because the question is, are the, do the scientists have an agenda? Um, but on the infra, in, in the context of infrastructure, uh, this means that we have infrastructure to borrow from, uh, infrastructure of the NGOs uh, and of journalism, uh, now of social media, uh, to make use of, that we are not, uh, we're not trying to build those institutions directly but trying to provide content, uh, trying to shape the way in which they do things. Uh, and, and our grantees, I think, have been reasonably successful in doing so, uh, given the nearly microscopic level of resources invested. Let me stop there. Thanks, Guy. So there is your, there's your answer to how you're going to spend that million dollars right there. <laughs> um, I'm glad to have it, John. Yeah. 